Hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of Letter to Flaw Interviews. My name is Sarfit Bharadwaj and in the 19th episode of this interview series, I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to be in conversation with Sarah Donna. Ma'am is the Director of Graduate and International Admissions at UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law, one of the finest law schools in the United States of America. And uh, I'm so thankful to you, ma'am, uh, that you've agreed to join me so early in the morning for you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Wonderful. So, ma'am, before we start talking about um, LLMs in the USA, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to our viewers? Yeah, so as you said, my name is Sarah Dorner, and I am the Director of Graduate and International Admissions at the University of New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce School of Law. We're located in the state of New Hampshire, about one hour from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm just looking at my, my background now. That's kind of what it looks like here today, actually, um, with the, the beautiful fall foliage and the, the leaves changing color. So it's a, a lovely place to be really every season of the year, but fall in particular is quite beautiful here in New Hampshire. Um, and so I oversee admissions for our, our graduate law degrees. We have three LLM programs in intellectual property, commerce and technology, and then an online LLM in international criminal law and justice. So I oversee admissions for all of those LLMs, as well as each of those degrees has a master's level for uh, students who have a bachelor's degree that's not in law. Um, so that's my role here at the law school. Great. Thank you for sharing that with us, ma'am. So let's dive right in. And I think the most fundamental question uh, to be discussed while speaking of LLMs is why do an LLM in the first place? What kind of value does it add to the modern age legal professionals? Now? What's your view on that? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, an LLM degree, really a U.S. legal education is it's valuable and it's held in high regard around the world. An LLM degree is that postgraduate degree um, that allows you, so the majority of students in our LLM degree have their, their LLB, their Bachelor of Laws, but it's also for students from the U.S. who have their JD, the Juris Doctor degree. So it is that postgraduate degree um, that's, I think, for some students looking for a more generalized program, it's going to give you a, a deeper understanding of the U.S. legal system. But for those who are looking to specialize in a specific area of the law, it's going to give you those expert credentials in that area of the law that you're looking to specialize in. Um, and with that, I think, you know, it's really attractive to employers. Um, it's going to help you get a job. It's going to help you get promoted sooner. Um, for students who, you know, want to have an extra credential, it will, in, in some states, allow you to sit for a U.S. bar exam. So it gives you that extra boost as well, um, particularly if you're looking to practice here in the U.S., you know, you would need to take that U.S. bar exam. Um, it's going to expand your network. Um, so you're going to connect with your, often your classmates or students from around the world, um, the faculty here when, when you're here on campus, as well as the school's alumni network. Um, so it's really going to just grow your network. Um, as we said, give you those credentials, help you find employment. I think it really helps your, your resume or your CV stand out. Um, and generally speaking, a, a law degree is, is valuable to have, um, particularly a U.S. law degree. Um, and even if you're not certain you're going to, to practice law long term, I think it's still a valuable degree that keeps doors open for you. Certainly. Uh, so, <laughs> ma'am, there's a lot to unpack in your answer. And I, I, I'd like to start right at the beginning. Um, yeah. You talked about how the Franklin Pierce School of Law has multiple courses to offer, the intellectual property course in particular being uh, renowned all across the world. And all over the USA, there are so many courses, there are so many schools to choose from. How do you suggest a student who's just finished his or her LLB or JD degree? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll speak in terms of LLB because most of the viewers here in India are pursuing that degree. So how do students, how should students go about selecting the course and school that's right for them? Yeah, so I think that's, um, you know, a, a big question um, and a lot of different things that you would want to consider. I think the, the first piece, and I had mentioned this and um, when we kind of opened up, is that there's kind of generally speaking two different types of LLM degrees, a, a general LLM that's going to just 
really focus on the U.S. legal system. Um, many of these are designed to prepare you for U.S. bar exam. And then there's specialized LLM degrees, which are like the ones that we offer here at, at UNH Franklin Pierce. So degrees in a specific area of the law. So for us, um, you know, we're an, a top IP school. Intellectual property is, is really the specialization. So it's going to give you those, those expert credentials. So I think the, the first piece is to kind of decide, are you looking for something that's more general or do you have a specific interest that you really wanna hone in on and, and, and focus on? Once you've made that decision, I think another kind of higher level decision to make is if you're looking to come to the US and, and spend a year physically studying here to earn your degree, or if you're looking to come do some distance learning and complete your program um, in your home country. Um, there's more and more online programs popping up. Um, many of these, I mean, we are intellectual property and our international criminal law and justice programs, you can complete 100% online. They are, you know, they're, they're top quality programs. I think the biggest piece to be mindful of is, is really two pieces. One is if you do wanna prepare for a US bar exam, the online program might not be the best program for you um, because a lot of states have restrictions around the number of, of online courses you can take. The other piece is um, if you are looking to pursue optional practical training, once you've completed the program, if you want to spend a year in the U.S. working, you need to first be in the U.S. to complete the program. So I think if you're really looking to get some work experience in the U.S., then you would want to physically come and do your degree here rather than online. So I think once you've kind of considered um, you know, general versus specialized and online or in person, a lot of it is really kind of coming down to, to you as an individual. Um, you know, things like location. Do you want to be in a big city um, or are you looking for a smaller town? Um, the school itself, do you want to be in a really big school with a really large LLM class, which might have a pretty large international student body? Or do you want a more intimate program where you're really going to get to know your classmates and your professors? Um, so that's a really personal decision that, that students need to make. Um, I encourage students to really um, also think about, you know, the the, the program itself. So think about, again, if you're looking for a specialized program, look at the course offerings in that in that area, right? Look at the, the depth of programming, of courses, take a look at the faculty and see if they really match the areas that you're looking for. Find out a little bit more about student organizations, for example. Um, do they have clubs that you would want to join? Are there opportunities for students to take on leadership positions? You know, here at UNH Franklin Pierce, um, our student um, government associations, a student bar association, they have two, um, two leadership spots for LLM students. So, you know, th these are all things to consider. Um, find out another question too that I think is important to ask is kind of who are you taking your classes with? Are you just a cohort with the LLM students or are you also getting to take classes with JD students? Um, in terms of reputation, I think, you know, it, it's not everything, right? It, it matters. You want to make sure you're, you're studying at a school that's well respected, but it's not everything. Um, I will say, though, if you're looking to do a specialized LLM, you might want to consider those specialty rankings. So, um, you know, schools are kind of ranked overall and then they're, they're ranked for their specialization. So if you're looking, for example, you know, with UNH Franklin Pierce, if IP is, is what you want to study, then coming to a top school like in, uh, UNH Franklin Pierce um, that really specializes in intellectual property, you know, it's worth looking at those rankings. Um, so yeah, I think that's, you know, a lot there to kind of um, for students to consider. Um, so both, both the classroom piece you want to be looking at kind of what is offered? Am I going to be happy as a student here? And then kind of the, the more kind of social or co-curricular aspect of things and, and what's going on. Another piece that you might want to look at is, you know, I mentioned OPT. So, um, you know, what supports are in place for students who want to stay in the U.S. after they've completed the program um, in terms of, you know, applying for OPT, both from the immigration perspective, um, as well as like a career services perspective. And I think that's another piece of the puzzle, too is those types of services. So um, clinics are a great opportunity for students to kind of gain some hands-on experience and have an opportunity to, pra to practice under you know, the guidance of a, of a trained attorney. Um, so find out what types of you know, clinics are offered at the law school and, and the access that LLM students have. And then career services, you might wanna ask questions about um, you know, our career services, is that office supporting students as well? What types of supports are in place? Um, 
So I think it's it's a really personal decision. Um, and I think every each student is looking, there's different things that they're looking for. But I think generally speaking, you know, those are some of the, the areas that you might want to ask some questions about. Right. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us, Sam. <laughs> uh, moving on, what do you think is the right time to apply for an LLM? I'm sure there are students who come in right after finishing their undergraduate law degree, or there are some students who come after a considerable work experience. Which of the two in your experience of handling graduate admissions mm -hmm. tends to do well and what kind of students uh, perform better in an LLM? Yeah, so, you know, I can tell you, you know, my, my personal experience here um, is that we're looking for both types of students. And I would say our student body really is a, a mix. Um, our students from India do tend to kind of come straight from their LLB or maybe just have one or two years of, of work experience after graduation. Our students from countries like South Korea or China, they tend to be mid-career professionals. So it makes for a really rich um, classroom dynamic. I don't, you know, I think, again, this might be a question that if there's a certain school that, that you have in mind that you want to apply to, ask the school, right? Like what type of candidate are they looking for? At UNH Franklin Pierce, we truly are looking for both. We take a holistic review when we're looking at applications. So if you have work experience, we're absolutely going to look at that and, and consider that. If you don't, that's okay. And we want to hear a little bit more about your experience at law school. You know, did you do any internships? Were you involved in, in extracurricular activities? We're going to look at your um, the letters of recommendation um, that, that hopefully faculty or, you know, internship supervisors will write about you um, to see what they have to say. So I think it's okay. Um, either approach is, is fine. Um, I think for those who have work experience, sometimes they know a little bit more what they really, you know, why they're doing the LLM and what they hope to get out of it. But for students who are coming, you know, kind of straight from their, their LLB, they're, they know that they ultimately want to get this degree. And so they just want to keep moving through and, and that's fine. Um, both students are successful in our program. And I think both kind of get something different out of it um, and from one another really. Um, so it's nice to have a mix in the classroom. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this, uh, so students who come right after an LLB degree or an undergraduate law degree, can they also apply and do success and perform successfully well in a specialized degree, for instance, the intellectual property course, because there would also be working professionals who have worked in the area of IP for a considerable amount of time. And then there are students who've just got out of law school and they are put in the same class. Does that uh, create uh, difficulties? So it really doesn't. And I think for a, a couple of reasons. First, we're finding that even if students are coming right from their LLB, they often have had some opportunities where they've taken some, you know, intellectual property, you know, courses, whether it's part of their LLB or courses that they did over the summer, um, or they had an internship where they gained some hands-on experience in that area. Our program also is designed so that there's really just a, a handful of courses that are required for all LLM students. And these are the more general courses. So it's, you know, an American legal process and analysis and a, a graduate legal research course. They're not the specialized intellectual property courses. Those courses students are really getting to take with our um, upper level JD students. So they're in there taking those electives um, and our JD students are typically students who in the US, you, you earn your four year bachelor's degree and then you apply to law school for your, your Juris Doctor, your JD degree. Um, so they're taking courses with those students who maybe also haven't had a, a lot of work experience. You know, certainly some JD students have had years of, of work experience, um, but they wouldn't have been, you know, practicing attorneys yet. Um, so I think it's, everybody can gain something from it, whether or not they're coming with, with IP experience or not. Right. And I'm just uh, staying a little bit more on the topic of work experience, because that's a question that Indian students often uh, deal with. Um, what kind of work experience is preferred? Because there are students who choose to either clerk with a Supreme Court judge for a couple of years, who perhaps dive right into litigation, or some who join a corporate law firm. So as someone who looks at applications regularly, do these work areas matter or just work experience in any field is good enough? Yes, it's a good question. I think the answer is, is yeah, yes, they, they both matter. I mean, we, we do look at, at what you're doing, but also just having that experience in general. 
Um, again, you know, if, if you're looking for a generalized LLM program, I think it might matter a little bit less. If you're looking, you know, for a more specialized um, LLM program, we might be looking for some work experience in that area. Um, particularly for someone who's kind of like mid-career, although, you know, we've seen kind of mid-career attorneys who maybe just had an opportunity to only kind of dabble in intellectual property and then realize that this is their passion. And then they want to come and get the LLM so that they can really, you know, gain the knowledge and skills to support the work that they're, that they're doing. Um, so I think I, you know, my advice would be not to worry too much about the specific work experience. Um, any work experience is valuable and, and teaches you new things and help you helps you see the world in a different way. And these are all things that, you know, the folks in admissions are going to be looking for. I think one thing would, that that's helpful is when you particularly as part of the application, you'll typically write, you know, an essay, a statement about why you're pursuing this, this degree or the program. Um, and speaking a little bit more about how your work experience has kind of led you here, um, or how you'll use this degree in, in future work um, pursuits. Um, you know, we can see your, your CV, so we don't need your statement to be kind of just summarizing that, right? Um, we want to know kind of how all these pieces fit together and have kind of led you here to, to pursue your LLM. Right. Again, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts on this, ma'am. Uh, moving on, uh, I want to talk a little bit about preparing a good, a solid LLM application. And I think one of the foundations of that is a person's statement of interest or statement of purpose. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of an SOP do you think works really well how students can write a solid SOP that can make a compelling impression? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think there's no, there's no right answer. Um, it's gonna look different for each person. Um, there's not a certain template that we're looking for. You know, as I just mentioned, what we don't want is to you just to kind of say, I did all of these things. We see that, we see that yes, part of the application, you're submitting your resume or CV. Um, so we can see all the wonderful things we, that you did. The, the essay is really an opportunity to share a little bit more about kind of your own personal story or journey. Um, why do you wanna get your LLM? What do you hope to do with it? If it's a specialized LLM, you know, why the specific area of the law? How have you kind of, you know, what have you learned from your work experience that's made you realize that you want to get this degree? And then also kind of what, what are your plans after this? Um, how will you use the degree? Um, and how will you contribute while you're here? Kind of, you know, why would we want you to be a part of our student community? Um, you know, are there certain groups you want to get involved in? Certain professors you're excited to work with? Um, these are all things that are, you know, worthwhile to kind of spell out in your essay. I think I would also say that it's okay if you don't have all the answers to what the future holds for you. And, and it's okay to say that. So I would encourage students to be honest and, and transparent and just genuine in, in that statement. Um, it's okay to say, you know, intellectual property is my passion. I don't quite know yet exactly, you know, in what specific area or how I wanna go about this, um, but I know that I really wanna, wanna learn more. Um, that's okay to say. The other thing that I always advise too is, you know, that whether it's in your, your essay itself or kind of just a supplemental, you know, addendum, if there's something in your application that might raise eyebrows, so maybe your grades kind of suffered one semester, um, it's a good opportunity, you know, within the essay to, to kind of name that, right? Again, be transparent. Um, if there's something that you think we might ask questions about, like, oh, there's this three-year gap where it seems like you weren't in school, you weren't working, name that. Um, be honest about it. Whatever it was, you know, it, it's okay. Um, and let us know, because probably those three years um, added to your story, you know, probably something was going on that helped you get to where you are today. And um, so just kind of, if there's any kind of questions out there, fill in the blanks through your essay. Let us know what, what the, uh, the complete story is. Right. And also, ma'am, are there some things that tip the admissions office off which make them go, oh my God, why is this SOP drafted like this? Or why is the person writing mm. this? Are there things that people can avoid? Yes. Yeah, so I would say if you're <laughs> applying to multiple law schools, make sure that before you submit your application to any given law school, that, that the right school is listed. So I've definitely <laughs> seen essays where people say, I'm so excited to study at X school, which is not our school. Um, 
which makes me wonder, are you excited to come and study at this school? So I think those are kind of, you know, the obvious things to, to check for. Um, you know, we know that there's going to be some spelling mistakes here and there, but you do really want to limit those types of things. Um, as I said, we we we're, we know you're great, right? Like we know that if, if you're considering pursuing, you know, a degree in the U.S., we we know you've probably accomplished a lot already. So we don't, again, don't just spell out what's in your resume and tell us how wonderful you are. The other thing is, and I think um, it's a delicate balance. We do want to know why us, you know, why you want to study here in particular. What we don't want you to do is just copy and paste from our website. Um, so of course, like we, it, it, we do want to see that you've researched us and you've learned a little bit about, you know, why this school, um, but try to take, take from, you know, our website and, and make it your own a little bit, or at least apply it to, um, you know, so for example, we have, um, one of the largest academic libraries, IP libraries in the Western hemisphere. So I know that if somebody mentions that in their essay, that they've really done their research and they've, they've looked us up, they know what we have to offer. Um, but tell me more about why that's important to you. You know, why do you care that we have that, that library and those resources? You know, how will you use those resources? So I think kind of connect the dots. Great. Uh, and I think, ma'am, I'll move on to the next important part of the application that I believe are the references. Um, mm -hmm. Now, references, I believe, can be of two types. Um, if a student is applying right after law school, chances are he or she will uh, rely on academic references, um, their professors and so on. Someone has worked for a considerable period of time. There will also be some professional references. Um, what kind of references are law schools in USA generally looking for? Are they really looking for academic references that can speak to a person's uh, academic abilities or are they looking for something else as well? Yeah, so I can tell you for, for UNH Franklin Pierce, it's, it's often both. Um, so I would encourage students to ask the law schools that you're applying to what they're looking for. Um, for us, we are looking, you know, if you've been in school within the last five years, we require that one of your letters comes from a professor that can really speak to your ability to be successful in the legal classroom. But if you have work experience, we also want to know more about your ability to be successful in the workplace. So I think it's great to have both um, academic and professional. What we don't want to see are letters from just like your family and friends, yeah. um, you know, telling us how wonderful you are. We want to know a little bit more about kind of um, particularly from a professor, you know, how you'll contribute in a classroom setting, um, what makes you stand out. Um, and then employers too, you know, they can often speak to a little bit more about, you know, what, what you're like to, to work with, your ability to be successful as part of a team, um, your, your knowledge of this, you know, the subject matter. Um, so both are important um, and, and we like to see both. Again, for students though that don't have a lot of work experience, that's okay if they're just submitting um, that's absolutely okay. Um, and so I don't want students to stress about if they don't have a professional reference. Um, again, we're taking a holistic approach. We're looking at you um, based on your own personal experience so far. Um, and you know, we certainly, again, on the flip side for students who've been out of school for quite some time, can be really hard to, to get a letter from a professor. And so again, it's okay if you can't submit one and we'll take two professional letters instead. Ma'am, another question about references. If someone, let's say a Supreme Court or a High Court judge is writing a reference to you, uh, for you, and there are other references from your, you know, normal professors who taught you in class or some, somewhere else that you work with. Does that carry weight? Does who writes a reference for you carry weight? Or does a reference that can really speak to a person's ability speaks uh, more? Um, great question. I think both. I think we, yes, it, it does carry weight depending on who it's coming from if that person can say something really meaningful and about you, if they, if all they can really say is, I knew this person, that doesn't really do much. Um, one thing that, you know, we oftentimes, a lot of our students come to us because they were referred by alumni of the program. And so that holds weight for us, right? Because we know our alumni and we know how wonderful they are and how successful they've been since leaving here. So if an alum, you know, writes a letter on behalf of an applicant, you know, well, we really trust that source. Um, 
But I think, again, you know, even if it's someone, who, you know, an assistant professor um, who really knows you as a person and, and can speak to that and just, you know, maybe uses one or two lines to kind of say how they know you and for how long, that's helpful because we know um, that we're getting a real quality assessment about, about the individual who's applying. Um, so I think, again, I, you know, it, it's, I hate to kind of say both is important, but I, I think both do hold hold value depending on, on how they're used. But ultimately, the more specific um, your recommender can be about you as a person, um, the more we learn about you and, and the more that adds value to your application. Right, uh, thanks for sharing that. Actually, the reason why I asked this question is because a lot of Indian students uh, do judicial clerkships not because they really want to, but because it's a feeling that a reference from a judge helps them get admission to a top US law school because uh, in USA, apparently judicial clerkships are a whole, whole, a lot of value. Uh, yeah, and so I think, yeah, sure, it looks impressive, right? But if all they can say is, I worked with this person from this date to this date, that doesn't really tell me too much. Um, and again, we'll see from your from your resume that that you have this work experience. Um, so I think, you know, for us, we we require two. Some schools will require more or accept more. So I think if you're really struggling, you know, if you have like a third person that you think would be great, it's okay. You know, talk to the school and say, is it okay if I submit three? Um, some schools do have a limit though um, about, you know, so you you do as the applicant really needs to think, you know, who knows me best or where did I shine the brightest um, and, and ask those people to, to comment on your behalf. Sure, thanks. Thanks again for your thoughts on that, ma'am. Uh, now I'll quickly come to the third aspect of the application that is the resume. Um, now again, mm -hmm. students here in India tend to do a lot of moots as I'm sure they do uh, all over the world as well. Uh, Indian students also uh, actively write research papers and they have uh, a couple of publications. So what, what kind of uh, CV looks really well? One that has a lot of moot court uh, performances or good publications or a lot of internships. What kind of a CV is more uh, desirable? You know, I think, again, this could really depend on, on the school. Um, so it, questions to ask, but I, I think it all, like I think having something that's balanced um, is helpful. Again, though, we don't expect that you will have done it all, right? Nobody can, can do it all. So I think, you know, for students who are kind of trying to figure out where they fit and what they like best, having a little bit of ex experience in different areas is helpful. If you know from the start, like moot is my passion and this is what I'm going, you know, I'm and you're going to focus your energy there, then what we'd be looking for is kind of growth and, and progress along the way. Um, so I think, again, it depends on the individual. Um, some people do have a specific, you know, area where they excel and they're going to put their efforts there. And, and that's great. And what we want to see is you excelling. And then others are kind of going to dabble in a few different areas gain some different experience and, and that's great as well. Again, I think it's using that, that statement of purpose, your essay to kind of speak to how all the pieces of your, of your resume fit together and, and made you who you are and are leading you to where you are today. Um, and I feel I, you know, as I'm answering these questions, I'm like, oh, this is a, it's such a frustrating answer, I think, to because I'm not saying, you know, do this, but there's not a clear path. Um, because everyone is different and schools are looking at different things. Um, so again, I, I guess what I'm coming back to is don't do something only because you think it will look good um, in your application. Do something because you, you want to do it. You think it's worthwhile for you and, and for your own personal growth and development. Um, and we'll probably see it similarly. Right. Thanks for your thoughts. Actually, your insights are very helpful on this, ma'am. And I am so <laughs> thankful to you for, you know, uh, sharing your thoughts on this. I feel like I'm giving you all these kind of um, like gray fuzzy answers not rather than concrete. You know, this is what you need <laughs> to do, but it's just not so black and white, I think. Sure. Yeah. Sure, definitely. Uh, Ma'am, just another question on the resume. Um, so if a person has done, let's say a famous mood like Jessup's, that will obviously carry a lot of weight. But if a person has done a national mood that isn't known globally, but is, of considerable repute or maybe not even uh, very well known in India, but the person has won that. Is that good enough for, for putting it on your resume? Absolutely. I think, you know, I always err on the side of 
you know, certainly, you know, we don't want resumes that are like five pages long, but I would err on the side of, of being inclusive. If you think you've done something of, you know, that we might take interest in knowing about, absolutely include it. Um, and you can kind of comment too, you know, if you think that the person who's reviewing, reviewing your resume might not know about that particular experience, it's okay to kind of include a line of, you know, this is one of like the you know, in India, this is really held in high regard um, because we might not always know, right? We, we review applications from all over the world. Um, some countries we know more about than others, but I, you know, I think most admissions professionals are not experts in every country. And um, so I think it's okay to kind of add some context um, that you think might be helpful for the admissions professionals to know. Right, uh, thanks for that. And ma'am, I'll quickly ask this question about publications as well. Does the same hold for uh, where you get your paper or article published? For instance, obviously, if, you, if you're getting it published in a national, if an international journal of repute, Oxford, Cambridge, or something like that, right. that obviously carries weight. But if you're getting it published in an Indian law review journal, is that good enough also? That's Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The fact that you're getting something published, we want to know about that. Um, yeah, we want to know more about what it was about. And um, so I think absolutely, er, always err on the side of including those things in, in your CV so that, that we can see. Um, and again, I think most schools, so they'll check, um, but I know certainly for us, there's always an opportunity if you feel like there's something more that you weren't able to capture as part of kind of, you know, your essay or the your cv that that you can add a supplemental kind of comment or you know um you know submit a separate essay um so that we can kind of understand a little bit more about who you are the other thing too is you know reach out to us you know we're happy we don't some schools do require an interview we do not but most of the folks that um you know apply to our program and are, are really serious about coming i'll often have a conversation with them that they, they've initiated where they can tell me a little bit more about themselves and and we'll make note of these things as well so i think um you know if you feel like there's something that, that you forgot to include in your application or that you think would be helpful for us to know please don't hesitate reach out um you know send us an email or ask to schedule a conversation we're happy to do that wow wonderful uh, I'm just another question on this, uh, because what I see a lot of Indian law students doing is publishing short articles and blogs at various places. And of course, in addition to papers. Now, can you also put these short articles and blogs? Do they qualify as academic research of publishable quality or should you only publish like peer reviewed published uh, papers? I so uh, my my guidance here, which is just be transparent about what it is. I think it's you know if you're doing these things, you know I think about like this podcast that you're doing, right? Like that's really cool. Is it you know kind of an academic publication? No, so you don't want to say that it is. Um, but if I was you, right, this is something that I would want to be including um, on my CV. Just being honest about you know this, I I write these blogs for this audience. Um, I think it's great to include those things. Just don't claim that there's something they're not. You know, if it wasn't, you know, an academic research publication, don't say that it was. Right. Thanks for that. Uh, that brings me to an end of the application segment. Thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts. Um, I'll quickly move on to the next part now. Uh, do you think that where a person did his or her LLB or undergraduate law degree from matters? Because uh, here in India, some of the finest law schools are the national law schools. But then there are a variety of other law schools that are known uh, to a lot of people, even here in India. So if someone has done their LLB degree from such a college, will that be uh, you know, a roadblock to getting admitted to a fine law school like the Franklin Pierce Law School? So I'm going to give you another fuzzy answer here. So I think Sure, it matters, right? Like if we see that you went to a top school, well, we're going to notice that. Yeah. But what matters more, I think, is how how well you did. Um, so great if you got into this top law school, but if you had terrible marks, well, that we, you know, that doesn't that doesn't look great. Um, whereas if you get into a lesser known school or maybe still a really top school that we just don't know about, but we see that you did really well, um, you know, we're looking for that. So I think. Sure, like, you know, a name can carry weight, but only if you are successful there. Um, 
So it, I, I think, I guess the point being that it's not enough to just go to a top law school. Mm -hmm. We are still looking at, at your marks, at your, you know, what kind of activities you did while you were there. All of those things still matter. Right. Uh, that's that's a very encouraging answer. I'm going to use this for the yeah. trailer of this video. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, right. Uh, Ma'am, just another quick question on the marks, uh, the importance of marks that you talked about. I'm sure each law school does um, have its own minimum GPA criteria. What, according to you, is a good enough GPA to get you into top law schools, including Ivy League or law schools of which, which carry equal prestige in America? Yeah. So again, hard to answer because I think, you know, and, and one piece you know, to, of, of caution for students as they're applying is some schools, and, and we are one of them, require what's called the transcript evaluation, um, where essentially you have your academic records evaluated by a credential authentication service that verifies, okay, you really earned these credentials. They're kind of equivalent to this degree um, and helps us understand your grades better and kind of in the context of, of the US grading system. So it is hard to say, you know, X GPA because that might look a little differently here for us. Yeah. Um, but the grades, so, you know, we're looking at your grades, we're looking at kind of consistency over time. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see that some as students kind of just started law school, maybe it took them a little while to get comfortable. So that's okay. Certainly, you know, we would anticipate now that, um, Things might have gone a little bumpy for people when, when COVID first happened. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some people had, you know, grades suffered as a result. Um, life happens. We know this. Um, but this is where, I, you know, I mentioned before that if there's something that we might be curious about, it's okay to, to name it, to say in your essay, you know, I had a really hard time adjusting to remote learning when, when COVID first started. Um, my grades took a bit of a hit, but as you can see, I was able to work through that and, and did better. Um, we're going to notice that. So it's not just about at the end what that final GPA was, you know, we're looking at that, of course, um, but we're also kind of looking at over time how you did, knowing that sometimes there's just a semester that might have been an off semester and, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, just moving on very quickly, it's the topic of uh, finances and scholarships. That's also a very, very integral thing because yeah. a US LLM degree can be quite expensive. Uh, so I understand each university has its own criteria and for awarding scholarships and different scholarships that students can apply for. But in general, do you have some broad um, advice on students to manage their finances? While yeah, so my first advice would be um, to start saving because you're right, <laughs> yeah. it can be quite expensive. Um, so start saving, you know, as part of the um, visa application process, you're going to need to show that, that your bank account has sufficient funds to pay for your tuition and your cost of living. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. The next step would be to talk to the schools about their scholarship opportunities. I would advise too, when you're looking at this, right, look at the, the whole picture. So maybe the school has like a 50% tuition scholarship and then the other school only has 15%, but how much is their tuition to start, right? So look at the, the bigger picture, you know, when you have any offers and, and the scholarship decisions are made, crunch the numbers for each school, look at that total tuition, what your scholarship package is, and then also as much as you can, try to ask some questions or do some research around the cost of living in that area. Um, so again, there's obviously benefits to living in a, in a large city, but it can also be quite expensive. Um, so I would say kind of, you need to factor all of that in when, when making decisions. Um, in addition to scholarships through the school, you know, there's obviously some other opportunities out there such as Fulbright, um, Education USA, I think can be a great resource. You know, they're a, a through the State Department and they're around the world and, and they have resources in each country about you know, different scholarship opportunities. So I would say do some research there. Um, and then in terms of kind of loans, those can certainly be a bit harder to come by. You know, there's a couple of loans. One that comes to mind is called Empower Financing that our students have used to take out loans for their education. Um, so I think a lot of times it's, it's piece, piecemeal, right? Different, you kind of get some scholarships here, maybe you take a loan here, but you kind of pull all the pieces together and then some savings as well. Um, we get a lot of questions from students about, you know, working while they're here. Um, 
you're the typically students are coming on an F1 student visa and that does have some restrictions around where you can work and how many hours you can work. So I always advise students that, you know, it might be possible to get a job at, at the school, but don't rely on that money. Um, that would, you know, think of that as kind of just extra spending money. Don't have that be part of your plan for, for funding your education. That's, that's some sound advice and it'll be really helpful to all our viewers. Thanks for that. Um, I'll move on next to the employment opportunities after an LLM. Uh, what kind of um, avenues for work do you think an LLM degree opens up? Yeah, so what, what we're finding a lot is that our students who come through our, our program will want to pursue um, OPT, optional practical training. Um, so that's, you know, essentially their visa will allow them to stay in the U.S. for an additional year to get work experience um, because students do want to have that on their resume that they, they had some time working in the U.S. Um, in terms of the job, I mean, obviously there, there are a variety of, of different legal positions, whether it be at a small law firm, you know, a larger firm firm, corporation, um, all of our LLM students have access to our career services office. So they're going to help students um, with their resume, with cover letters, um, job interviewing skills, networking. Um, they're, they're not going to hand you a job, right? Like we, we don't just have a whole bunch of jobs lined up for graduates. These oh. are, you have to go out and get those, but we're going to help you get there. And of course we have wonderful alumni around the world. And so we're tapping into those alumni networks as well um, and trying to help build connections for students that way. So I think um, there's a lot of resources here to support students in finding a job, but it will be on the student to actually find the job. Um, Right. Yeah, but I, so I, again, you know, I would say when you're looking for schools, ask about the career services office, ask how they, you know, work with LLM students, what supports are in place, um, because you might want to tap into those, even if you aren't looking to stay in the U.S., right? Um, the career services office can still help you with, with all of those skills that will translate wherever you're going and can help you ideally tap into the alumni networks in your home country as well. Definitely. Uh, Ma'am, do you think students can get some employment opportunities with just the LLM degree, because I suppose in order to be a full-fledged lawyer, you'll have to clear the bar exams. If a student does not want to do that or cannot do that, I, I suppose that's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, so can, do work opportunities open up with just an LLM degree? Yeah, and in, when you ask that, are you asking specifically here in the US or just in general? In, in US, yeah. In the US, so, so yes, I think, again, if you are looking to practice as a licensed attorney here in the US, you will need to take that, that bar exam. Um, but you can cert there are certainly jobs that um, you know, will value um, students who have their, their legal education in a different country and then earn their LLM. That is still absolutely a value to some employers, um, even if you don't have the bar exam. And I think likewise, you know, if you are looking to return to India, um, you know, it, you might not need to take the bar exam. You know, it might really, it might stand out that you have that credential, but it, as you, you know, it's a whole lot of, of um, study time. It's, it's, it's a massive undertaking. So if you don't really need it or don't plan to use it um, and it, you have that LLM and that's already desirable to, to a future employer, then you might not need to take the bar exam. Sure, ma'am, could you talk a little bit about what are the kinds of jobs that open up with just an LLM degree in USA? Yeah, so I, I think it really varies, and I'm, I'm thinking back to kind of some of our, our recent graduates, um, but one of them had like a, was a, had a clerk position at a, at a small, a small practice. One did go on to like a corporation, and these were actually jobs that they took, I think, while they were waiting to take the U.S. bar exam, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a, it's really, there's a, a range of different opportunities. Um, I think, uh, I'm like jogging my memory here. I think most students that stay and do OPT, I think because they're here and, and pursuing work in the US, that, that they're also studying for the bar while they're doing that um, because they're here already. Um, and then I think a lot of though that students who aren't pursuing OPT feel that you know the LLM is what they came for um, and that they plan to go back and practice in their, in their home country and um, don't need the work experience here as well. Interesting. Thanks for that, ma'am. Uh, now I'll come quickly to the final set of questions that I have. Uh, th these are miscellaneous questions just all over the place. Uh, in India, ma'am, recently, 
LLM has been made of two years. Earlier, it used to be a one year. Now it's mandatorily of two years. And I suppose in USA, some schools offer it for a period of nine months or a year. Uh, do you think one year is good enough for an international student, you know, to come all the way from a different country, acclimatize in the USA, study, look for jobs? Or do you think that this period is not long enough and it vanishes as soon as it starts? So I... I think, you know, it's an interesting question because I, I think most LLM programs now have kind of moved to that one year model and typically one year being, you know, the academic year in the U.S. tends to start in August and end in May. So as you said, it's really more like nine months that you're actually here. Um, yeah, it does go by quickly, but what we find is that our students, so most LLM degrees are 24 credits. At UNH Franklin Pierce, students are still able to take more than that minimum number um, at no additional cost. So they can take up to, I believe, is 34 credits. So we'll find that our students, um, you know, 17 credits a semester um, can be quite a lot. Um, but students really want to maximize their time with us. So they're often taking more than that minimum 12 to make the most of their time here. Um, I think what we're finding is that for, for most students, it, it is enough, right? That um, they're coming for the degree and for that, that U.S. experience, and then they are ready to kind of move on to the next steps in their career. They don't want to drag this out for, they want to be working. Um, so we're finding that that model really does work. Um, we've been, you know, a one-year program for as, for as long as I'm, I'm aware of, um, and it's, it's worked well for students. It's given them the, the education that they need, the experience here, um, and then kind of set them on their, their path for career advancement. Right, wonderful. And now I'll come to the final question. This is the question that I ask all the guests who've been on the show. Uh, oh, do I'm have... nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have some book recommendations for our viewers? Anything that you've enjoyed reading or you think students from India might enjoy learning about the legal system in the USA or anything general also? What, what you've been reading lately, uh, anything at all? Yeah, you know, it pains me to say this. I I used to read so much, um, and then I had children, and it yeah. just there's no. And so my youngest just turned one this past weekend, and I've listened to like a couple audiobooks here and there. Um, but was one of my goals is like as they kind of get older to get back to reading. So I don't have any new and exciting advice. What I do have, but not at my fingertips right now, um, are some resources that, that might be helpful for your viewers. And I'd be happy to kind of, you know, as a follow-up, send you some of those suggestions, um, sure. whether some of them are even just like little videos, um, but there are some books as well that, that might be of interest um, to, to the folks watching this. So I will send that to you as a follow-up so that you have it. Yeah, wonderful. I'll put that in the description section. Uh, yeah. I'm just, you know, um, I'm so embarrassed to say I don't get to read. And I'm part of a book club, too. Um, <laughs> but I don't usually make it. <laughs> uh, not at all. Um, ma'am, so before we actually close, I'd just like to tell my viewers that uh, Sarah, ma'am, has been conducting a wonderful uh, set of webinars on the LLMs in USA. That's how I got to know about ma'am's work. And then I reached out to her and she was very kind to uh, join me for this conversation. Um, could you please uh, tell us, uh, tell our viewers how they can attend the future webinars, how they can register, because I'm sure listening to your talk is helpful to a lot of us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So that's right, we, you had joined the first webinar I did on kind of how to choose an LLM. Certainly that recording is now on the UNH Franklin Pierce website and folks are welcome. I, if you wanna share my contact information, I'm happy to kind of send that to, to people as well. The next webinar is coming up this Thursday at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and it's on the value of an LLM. So we'll kind of get into some of the, the topics we talked about today, but um, our Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, Dean Rebecca Purdom will be joining me for that. Um, and she's fabulous and has worked in LLM programs for a number of years. So I'm excited to have her kind of share a little bit more of her insights. So that's this Thursday, absolutely still time to register and you can find it on the UNH Franklin Pierce website. Um, and again, um, I'm happy to kind of pass that along to you as well. And then the, the final webinar this for this fall and the series that I'm doing will be November 18th. And the topic is really making the most of your LLM experience. So a little bit more about things like career services, participating in clinics, um, pursuing optional practical training, getting involved in student groups. We'll talk a little bit more about some of those topics. Wonderful. And I encourage all my viewers to sign up for those webinars. They're super helpful and they'll uh, delve into 
uh, specific topics in a lot more detail than this uh, podcast. So be sure to check that out. And I think with that, as our Imam, we can come to an end of today's conversation. Thank you so very much for taking the time out and speaking with me. That was so early in the morning in the USA for you. Yeah. Um, so grateful for your time and consideration. And help. Oh, thank you. It, this has been really fun. It's been a it's been a good time. So thanks for reaching out. I'm glad we did this.